It will be a very different Remembrance Day and Remembrance Week this year. We will be unable to gather in traditional ways and to properly remember those who fell for our freedom. So we have sought some help and guidance from our friend Tim Cook. He is literally a one-man, award-winning, writing, storytelling, history-recording machine. He is, in fact, a historian at the Canadian War Museum and a professor of history at Carleton and the author of 13 books and about a million articles that have uh, been referenced. His most recent bestseller, The Fight for History, 75 Years of Forgetting, Remembering, and Remaking Canada's Second World War. Tim, it is incredible what you do, and, and I just want to start with that issue, which is, what are we going to do this year? Do you think it will be different, even this sense of it being the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II? It doesn't feel like it. There have been, there have been no ceremonies or commemorations. Yeah, well, thank you, Senator. Yeah, this was going to be an important year for us, and it still is. The 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War, that uh, titanic conflict that forever changed world history in which Canada played an absolutely crucial role. Um, 1.1 million Canadians who served in uniform. And we know that the 50th anniversary was important in 1994, right. 1995. This year would have been special, I think, because we have so few veterans. And I know that you have spent your life speaking to veterans, as have I. We're down to about 30,000, that 1.1 million. And I think this would have been a chance to stand together, to pay our respects, uh, to listen to their stories, to bear witness. And yet, of course, COVID has uh, diminished that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so you're right. I think this Remembrance Day will be different. Each Remembrance Day is shaped by the society that that it is a part of. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, I write in my book, The Fight for History, Remembrance Day was almost canceled. Uh, nobody cared. And so each, each Remembrance Day is different. I, I have always felt that on Remembrance Day, we do two things. We, we come together uh, in groups, small or large, at our local cenotaph or the national cenotaph to pay our respects. And we can't do that this year. Um, but what we can do is the second part, which is our own private thoughts, our own memories, our own reflections upon our experiences with perhaps a meeting a veteran in our life, someone in our family who has served, someone um, like my grandfather who served in World War II and has passed away. Or my other, father, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Uh, other veterans we've met, members of the Canadian Forces today, the Silver Cross mothers, the families that wait and worry and are separated by the service. We still have a chance to do that, and I hope we will do that on this Remembrance Day. It was always, and of course, I grew up in a small town in the in the prairies, but Remembrance Day, in part because of my father, but I also think just because of the communities in general, it was the most important day of the year. I seriously say that, and I'm including Christmas and those other things. It was powerful. There was the service. There was always a community community gathering, and then the... Um, the veterans, the old guys, went off into the Legion downstairs and had a drink or two. The kids uh, ran amok. And, uh, but it was a day of family connection, too. It's yeah. really important that we keep that. Yeah, I've always thought, remember, it's, it, it's a national day. We mark it across the country. And yet it is marked in our communities, isn't it? And it and that reflects, you know, our, our incredible commitment during the two world wars, if we were to think of that. Uh, the Great War of 1914 to 1918, where 620,000 Canadians served. That's from a country of 8 million, about one in three adult males. The Second World War, as we, as we said before, 1.1 million who served, including 50,000 women. And then since then, at least 200,000 who have served in Cold War and peacekeeping operations mm -hmm. and more recent conflicts. So, it's something that has deeply touched us, even though I think somewhat ironically, and I, I talk about this in my book, we often see ourselves as a peacekeeping nation, as a nation of, of uh, those that bring peace to others. And I'm very proud of our peacekeeping mm -hmm. history. But I've, I, I've spoken, as I know you have, to so many veterans who say, well, we're proud of peacekeeping too, but it takes soldiers to be peacekeepers. And we have- absolutely 
involved in six wars in the 20th century. Think of the Afghanistan war. Think of the 19th century, where it was a continuous period of conflict. The 18th century, that defined the very nature of our country. Before that, indigenous warfare. So we are a country of peace. We're one that believes in facing out onto the world stage and bringing good, I think. But sometimes that does involve a war and, and conflict as well. I want to get into that issue of what happened with um, Lester Pearson and the Nobel Peace Prize and the fact that we somehow felt obliged to redefine ourselves as peacekeepers rather than warriors. But first, let tell the story, because in the, even in the title of your book, you're talking about the fight for history and the forgetting of World War II. Somehow World War I, we all embraced. It was the Great War. Um, and this one was uh, diminished somehow. Why? Yeah, it was. That's, that's a good word, diminished. If we, if we just think about the Great War and its impact on Canada, where, as we said, 620,000 came together, the Canadian Corps, four divisions strong, our, our primary fighting force, um, uh, making a name for Canada at battlefields like Second Deep and the Somme, and of course, Vimy in April of 1917, and Hill 70 in August of 17, mm-hmm. and Passchendaele, the 100 Days Campaign, commanded by a Canadian, Sir Arthur Curry, by the summer of 1917, really a symbol of Canada stepping out and being recognized as, a, as an ally, even if a junior one. And it was, of course, a war that traumatized us with the 66,000 who died. Uh, and, and we were never the same after the war. Well, that's where Remembrance Day comes from, doesn't right. it? 1919 as Armistice Day. The poppy emerges from that war as a powerful symbol. Still with us today from John McRae's poem in Flanders Fields, we built thousands of memorials across the country. Every city, every town, every village. I know where you grew up. Mm-hmm. Wherever I can speak to someone in this country, there is a memorial there. And they all come from the Great War. We built the National Memorial in downtown Ottawa. The Peace Tower oversees the Vimy Memorial, Beaumont Hamel. And yet, what did we do for the Second World War? Right. Very little. It is very and, little. I mean, I it, it astounds me. We had even in Wadena, I, I I'm always amazed to tell this story, but we had a battalion called the Wildcat Battalion. It was a whole battalion of farm boys uh, from the area who went off. And even today, all our hockey teams in Wadena are called Wildcats. Right. That memory yeah. from the First World War, but again, nothing from the Second. Well, that's right. And so that's why I wrote the book, The Fight for History. I wanted to know that. You may remember I wrote a book on Vimy, The Battle and the Legend, and I was really trying to investigate why Vimy was such a prominent symbol. Why did people like Lester B. Pearson say it was the birth of the nation? Of course, he's one of our two prime ministers who served in the Great War, the other being Diefenbaker, of Mm -hmm. course. Um, Vimy is on our $20 bill. It's in our passport. It's It's an iconic symbol. And yet how many Canadians could say that we served six years in the Battle of the Atlantic, uh, keeping Britain in the war, that we sent 100,000 Canadians to serve in the Italian campaign, where we fought in Hong Kong, where we were involved in multiple air war campaigns, where we landed on D-Day, where we cleared Normandy, where we fought through the Scheldt. Um, these stories are not as prominent. And, and, and why is that? Well, I looked at the book, the return in the book, The Fight for the History, I looked at the return of the veterans. Um, After the Great War, we didn't do a good job in reintegrating our veterans. In the Second World War, though, they fought for their sons and daughters. And in fact, we were very forward thinking. We sent uh, veterans to university, 50,000. We retrained them for jobs. There were jobs in our country. Europe was in ruins. Canada's moving forward into a wealthy second half of the 20th century. And I think that's the key. We were looking forward. Mm -hmm. We weren't looking backwards and we didn't build those same memorials. And, um, and the veterans of the day said, we understand remembrance day is important. We will continue to mark that the poppy is important, but they said, where are the memorials? What will, how will we remember those who fell 45,000 Canadians who died during the second world war? And we didn't do that. And on top of that, we didn't do a good job in telling our stories. We didn't write the same novels, the plays. Exactly. All that literature that that was spawned by that. I I know when we had these conversations with um, 
with the veterans at home that served overseas, obviously, very rarely and usually only much, much later in life did they tell the stories. Initially, they only had those conversations by themselves. As I said, the guys went downstairs to have a drink. I think they talked there. We don't know. We weren't in the room. Mm -hmm. But they sure didn't talk to their families. We didn't have discussions about the horror show that yeah. they lived. We didn't have discussions about PTSD or yeah. what it was really like. Did we not let them? Yeah, I write about that in the book. And and part of that fight for history is, is comes from the veterans themselves who we have a better sense now, don't we, of post-traumatic stress disorder right. and the way that war imprints itself on people physically and mentally with invisible wounds. And we, we certainly have a a better sense of that after Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Uh, this generation, there was very little help for them. Um, it really, and it was a different generation of men. You'll remember that, you know, it's not that generation that would tell these stories. It was a much more stoic nature of what it meant to be a man was quite different. And you internalize these issues. And, and if you spoke about them, you spoke about them to the people who knew. And that was your comrades in arms, fellow veterans. And that's why Legion Halls became so important mm-hmm. in this country as a, you know, as a place to gather, to tell stories. And I argue in the book, and I talk about this, a cathartic effect to work through that. But what didn't happen, as you say, what didn't happen was the sharing of those stories. And I think um, Canadians were also to blame for that. We didn't create a space for them to tell their stories. We didn't encourage them. So we what, moved forward. Why Why is that? I, I, I get your point, and I think that's really true. They came back. They were given an opportunity. It was the late 40s, the 50s. The country was on the, the beginning of the boom. There was, as you say, a future. Suburbs were being built. Change was happening. Uh, everywhere. Television was arriving, all of these things that we can think of. Um, But, and so I understand that point about moving forward, but why, why did we not do it? Like, is there something at that time? I understand that next phase when Mm. we get to the peacekeeping phase, but in that interim. Yeah. I I don't There is. Yeah, I argue in the book, it's it's a number of things. One is, as we've talked about, the return of veterans, for the most part, treated well and, and building those mm-hmm. families and communities and moving forward. And if you were a, you were a young guy who enlisted in 1942 at age 18, you were, you were 22 by the end of the war. Many right. of them didn't see themselves or frame their identity as a veteran. That would take time later on. It's also because about one third of all males were veterans in Canada. I mean, that's astonishing. Yeah. We return to our our previous conversation of the idea of a peacekeeping nation. Well, if one third of adult males have served in uniform, we're not a peacekeeping nation. We're (laughs) we're a nation partially of warriors. But you're Um, also not then separate or special with the numbers that high. That's right. And yeah. and we didn't build the memorials and we didn't tell our story through novels and plays and films. You know, when I published my previous books, and this is my third volume in my Second World War series, The Necessary War, I, I, I toured across the country and I spoke to, to people and they, they said two things to me. One, you know, thank you for writing this because I didn't really know much about our history. I had, they had said I had grown up always reading World War II, but it was the British story, or it was the American story, or the German story. Great fascination with the Germans in in the Second World War, but not the Canadian story. And so, uh, thank you, they said. And the second thing they said is, I wish I had been able to talk to my dad or my uncle or my grandmother. You know, there was always a silence there, and and I was very grateful for this. But people said to me... um, you know, thank you, because my dad has passed away, they'd say, but now I have a better sense. Mm-hmm. Because when I write my book, uh, Senator, I, I, like, I, I speak to veterans, I read the letters and diaries. It's the voices of the eyewitnesses to history that are so important. We have to let them speak. And I believe that passionately as a, as a public historian um, that that we have to we have to hear their voices. We had a we had a veteran at home uh, recently passed away, Mike Soa. And he was part of the Italian campaign. And uh, he remembered going into a German town uh, 
and the armistice had been announced or the end of the war had been announced, but they weren't sure. And he was in a tank and they called him Little Mike because there were other Mikes uh, uh, as part of the group, but he was the smallest one. So they put him out uh, of the tank to uh, to see whether the, the Germans were respecting this. And there was quiet and he got out and he he went out and he took a German flag, a Nazi flag. And he sent it home to his family, um, and it, it did eventually get there. And the because the f- farm life was still tough, the women actually looked at the flag and thought, you know, should we make a blanket out of it or should we make <laughs> clothes out of it so as not yeah. to waste this fabric? Yeah. Um, and, and to me, that kind of speaks a little bit to it, too, this, this simple pragmatism of people who yeah. were eking out a living on farms and whatnot who who wouldn't have thought that there should be a museum to put that, lest we yeah. forget, but would have yeah. thought, can we use the fabric? Yeah, it took time. It takes time right. to understand. And and I understand that. And I, I work at the War Museum. Our, our collections are made up by Canadians and the material they carried and that they cared for and that mattered to them. And those battlefield souvenirs, which are really objects of memory if you think Mm -hmm. about it, right? It's um, it's something that reminds you of a time and a place. And, uh, you know, these are incredible stories. One of the things, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of at the War Museum are the army boots. Now, why Mm -hmm. would that be? Well, that exact story you said, the guys wore them back and they were such good boots. They just kept wearing them for years and years. Yeah. Um, But we do have incredible stories. And and for me as a public historian, I, the, the power of objects and to know that this was, was kept by a family for 50, 60, 70 years, that even when a, a father or a grandfather or an uncle or a brother passed away, or maybe even never came home, um, this object represents him or her, those who served. And to me, that's the power of, of artifacts, the power of our stories. And, and um, uh, it, it's a great pleasure to work at the Canadian War Museum where, oh, yeah. where I get to engage with this history every day. And I got to tell you that everybody I know who has been through there, and we always send them there. I know this is difficult in days of COVID, but it's an extraordinary experience. People do not I don't know what they think. They their 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 expectations are are so exceeded when they go in and feel it and see it. As you say, those artifacts make it yeah. make it so real. I was I was an adult before I went to. Well, I've driven through the town of Dafo in Saskatchewan probably two thousand times in my life. It's on the way to the to the city, and I was invited to. It, it turned out it was a British air training spot. You know, yeah. how did we not know that? Why is there not some big giant sign on the road that says we trained them all? <laughs> yeah, there should be. As you say, the, the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, uh, uh, an incredible contribution from Canada in the Second World War. We, we've been talking about fighting around the world in the Pacific and the Mediterranean, the Battle of the Atlantic, and in liberating the French and the Belgians and the Dutch. But in Canada, we trained 131,000 airmen from mm. the British Empire, from the United States. There were New Zealanders and Australians here. And uh, we built up, uh, if we think of the railway being the, the great uh, iron road that connected Canada in the 19th century. Well, uh, one of the great legacies of the Second World War is to create over uh, about 230 airfields and uh, schools and bases where we trained up these 131,000 airmen an incredible contribution by Canada to the air war, which was absolutely crucial. If we think of Bomber Command in right. striking back against the Germans, who were who had at this point already occupied Western Europe and were were carrying out their uh, unbelievably cruel occupation, and and soon to slip into genocide and the Holocaust. Um, this was a Canadian contribution, and what's fascinating, as you, as you have said, they were in the smaller communities across the country. Mm-hmm. Why is that? Because we have a lot of space in Canada <laughs> and we could, 
we could put those airmen up. And of course, it was very dangerous. Uh, several thousand airmen died in Canada. Their graves are here. They are marked on memorials. But there was also great stories of love and friendship. I know I've met um, women who married yes, airmen. Yes, marriages, I was going to say. That's <laughs> right. Um, and also a very human element, because a lot of these airmen um, stayed in the homes of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, on a farm uh, or, or in a local residence, because often the schools weren't big enough to hold them all. So really tight relationships between uh, the people uh, in the community and these airmen who often came through for six, eight, ten weeks on a course and then right. went off. And, and many stayed in touch with letters, um, sending care gifts uh, to them. And of course, sadly, finding out that 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 far too many of them uh, died uh, in the air war. You talked about the sense of space, and yes, of course, it was open there for them to learn and train, and 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 too often crash. It was. Uh, my dad was in the air force, but a lot of the people that I know that were his contemporaries were in the navy, and it always yeah. struck me that. Prairie boys from the farm would join the Navy. Is it because the water's flat too? I mean, you must have a theory on this. I do. And in fact, a veteran told me I was speaking in I was speaking in Saskatoon about my book, The Necessary War. It was at the great bookstore there. Is it McNally Robinson? Yeah, McNally Robinson, yeah. Yeah. And it was a huge crowd. About 150 people came out and I was talking and I could see there was a veteran there. He was an elderly gentleman probably in his mid nineties. And, and I kept turning to him. I wanted to engage him, but I was speaking and I went over and said, hello. And he said, I want, you, I don't, you know, such a gentleman, I don't want you to take time. We'll talk afterwards. I go, well, there's so many people here. I'll probably be signing books for an hour. I will right. wait, sir. I will wait. I'm like, oh, sir, no, <laughs> you know, I want to talk to you. And he said, I'll wait. So I, I do the talk. I, I signed books for an hour. He's still there. He comes <laughs> up to the end and he says to me, uh, and he had grown up in, in Saskatchewan and stayed there his whole life. And he said, a couple of things about your books. Um, I really appreciated. You nailed it. He served on a Corvette uh, okay. in, in the Atlantic. Yeah. And he said, you nailed it. And I said, well, wh what is that? I thought he'd be talking about the tactics or, uh, you know, the sea. He said, you nailed the smell. The smell of all of those unwashed men in the, in the belly of the Corvette was unbelievable. And I had <laughs> talked about that. And then he also said to me uh, the second thing. He said, thank you. And he was in tears. He said, I'm the last. I'm the last of my Corvettes. The other 94 men I served with are all gone now. And he says, you've, you've created something for them and for me. And I, I've always been touched by that. And, and I had asked him before that, um, that I was very emotional at that point. I asked him before, why did so many prairie boy, boys serve? <laughs> And he said, oh, it was the dust, the dust of the <laughs> depression, right? We have to remember those depression years were yeah. so awful. Yeah. And um, he did serve. And we have a new exhibition at the War Museum called Forever Change, Stories from the Second War. I've curated that. It'll open in December, and, and we're going to keep it up for a year. And we, we tell the stories of Canadians a bit like that. We have an amazing story of a, a Canadian um, Able seaman George Boyer, and he was from Saskatchewan. Yeah. He was Met Metis. Um, he had a family of 13. I can barely, about half of the brothers served, all in the Navy. Yep. Um, and he was he was part of the Battle of the Atlantic, keeping Britain in the war. Um, and we have his letters and his medal sets. And his really interesting story is that he served on the HMS Nabob, which is a, a British Royal Navy aircraft carrier. And um, he wrote there, we have his letters that he wrote home, and these letters, Senator, are so powerful to see the letters and the words and his expressions. And, and the Nabob was hit by a torpedo in, in August of 1944. 21 crew members were killed. Boyer survived, but one of his really close friends uh, was killed, and he writes home about that. And so it, that's just one of the stories we have in Forever Changed. And, um, it, you know, they're, they're just so powerful. To, to hear these and, and, and to see the letters. They were so humble. That's what, I mean, yeah. that's to, to your point. The the fellow would stand at the back of the room and wait for two hours and not yeah. 
want to take the spotlight or take a moment from you, even though their contributions. I, I don't want to forget about women either, because our our last remaining vet in uh, at home is is a woman, and I there's a story about Edith Whitford. I mean, she's from Alberta, but also she decided to move to Ontario. I think it was to Ajax to work yeah. in a munitions factory. Like there were people who did that kind of thing too. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, we think of the 1.1 million who served and 50,000 women in uniform, an incredible contribution. But another 3 million Canadians were involved in the war effort. And we were, we were, of course, an an agricultural powerhouse. We Mm -hmm. were a food power. Uh, All of that Saskatchewan wheat and our other food supplies, we, we kept Britain in the war. And if you think of the hundreds of millions around the world of young men who were pulled off their farms in Eastern Europe and in in Western Europe, United States, Canada, everywhere. It was Canadian food that kept Britain from starving out. Um, But of course, women were also involved in um, in munitions factories. And the story you you just mentioned there of, of Edith Volrath, who she, she grew up north of Edmonton, about 30 kilometers north of Edmonton. She was 18 years old. I can scarcely imagine, Senator. I have three I know. daughters. They're, they're 16, 14, and 12. And, and Edith went into a munitions factory. Um, she's then moved to Ajax, Ontario, so halfway across the country. And she spends the better part of two years creating the munitions that were essential for the war effort. And, of course, I think we have a sense of those factories of the time so loud, so dangerous, the chemicals poisoning them, uh, turning their hair yellow, um, respiratory issues, and yet they too contributed. And we've talked about the the air training plan. Well, we also also built 8,000 warships, 43,000 artillery pieces, 800,000 trucks, 1.7 million small arms. It's, you know, we were an arsenal of democracy and that too shapes our country. Mm-hmm. We become more industrialized. Um, uh, people begin to move in from the cities, and, and we see our cities developing with all the suburbs that emerge out of the war. And that's one of the reasons why in our exhibition at the War Museum, we call it Forever Changed. Our country was forever changed, but people like like Edith were forever changed. She, she returned back to Alberta. She started a family. I, I think if memory serves, she had seven children. And she was wow. like so many of those Canadians who who the war propelled them forward, some simply moving into the rest of their normal lives, others uh, doing great things, um, uh, uh, others uh, regular dads and mothers, and um, but ultimately they're the ones who helped to build up the country, the country we, that we have inherited. We always talk about the, the you know, the military industrial complex and what a bad thing it is or or um especially in terms of the US military that they you know recruit so many it's kind of their job creation uh plan in in the US but those things were crucial to us becoming a sophisticated modern economy yes indeed i mean defense production during the second world war pulls us out of the Depression. I mean, those mm-hmm. 10 years of the Depression were just gut-wrenching for Canadians, especially we know many in the West. Um, and the great fear in 1945, after victory has been finally achieved through just horrendous losses and service and sacrifice, the great fear is that we're going to slip back into a Depression. And I think the miracle of 1945 is that we don't, uh, that we move forward. And certainly all of the industrial uh, contributions of Canada, um, we are effective in in moving from producing the weapons that won the war into producing the commercial and civilian goods that will propel us forward. And you simply cannot understand the trajectory of our country unless you understand the enormous impact of the Great War and the Second War in in really changing who we are as a people. Okay, let's get to that spot. So the the men and the women come home and and they take some training and they get married and they set up shop in in a town or on a farm or in a city, wherever it may be. And then there's kind of a leap. There's a period in there before we get to the Lester Pearson, P. 
peacekeeping Nobel Prize. What What's going on in that period before we have this rather more official change that we are going to, in a sense, deny that part of the history and become peacekeepers? Yeah. Well, I talk about this in, in the new book, The Fight for History, The what happened to Canada? Because Senator, no one has ever written about this. There are mm-hmm. a lot of books on the Second World War, but then it's almost like we leave those war years, the 1939 to 45. And, and I was really interested from my many conversations over, I guess, 25 years now with veterans to hear what happened to their lives. How, exactly. did, you, how did you fit in? And I've been, people have been telling me stories for years. And, and because of my books now, people send me letters and memoirs. And so I try to work in those stories and I think we were successful. We, we were moving forward, as we said, into a period of prosperity in the 40s and 50s, uh, the baby boom generation, mm-hmm. which is just so crucial, um, uh, coming out of that wealth and, and I think confidence. But what we didn't do, as, as I've said before, is we didn't really tell our stories and we didn't focus on the wars. And then, of course, with, with uh, Pearson and the Suez crisis and being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, we... We, we changed and we, we began to embrace the idea of the peacekeeper, which again, as I've said, is, is an important symbol for Canada. Of course, it was situated within the Cold War. And I talk about the yep. Cold War yep. in the book where, you know, very strangely, we emerge from victory in, uh, if we said August 15th, 1945, the war against Japan. Well, the Guzenko defection happens only a month later, which reveals, uh, of course, the Soviet spy rings uh, around the world and even in Canada. And so that timing is really interesting. I remember. Yeah. uh, um, And so we we move very quickly into the Cold War. And, um, you know, I know Canadians like to think of themselves as as the honest brokers and the helpful fixers. Um, But of course, we chose our side and our side was the West and and Mm -hmm. we we stood with the United States and Britain, which was still war torn and suffering tremendous shortages of everything. Uh, We would join NATO in 1949. We we went to the Korean War in 1950, some 27,000 Canadians who served there over that three year period. Um, and so there's a lot happening in between the end of the Second World War and, and Pearson and peacekeeping. But those factors all together begin to erode or um, just simply we, we don't pay much attention to the Second World War. And it, and it continues on in the 60s and 70s, of course, then with the Vietnam War. Right. And I'm sure, Senator, you remember that period. And, um, you know, Quite and rightly. draft dodgers coming to Canada right. to absolutely war we, we, became we bad. Really, yeah, we distinguish ourselves from the Americans during that period. We mm-hmm. see ourselves as quite different, and this is a really important way. So, I mean, I've spoken to members of the Canadian forces who served in the sixties and seventies. They said you could barely walk down the street without mm-hmm. someone yelling at you, spitting on you. Um, so it's not surprising that during that period, if we think of how society um, shapes the way we remember and commemorate, well, Remembrance Day nearly died out. And in, yes. in the book, The Fight for History, in 1968, the Globe and Mail says, nobody is coming out anymore. And this is this is seen as a day of indifference. So that's how bad it was to the point where Remembrance Day was almost canceled. Um, and, and, and veterans themselves simply did not feel that there was any opportunity for them to share their stories or to, or to speak to the public. Um, and, and so there is a great silence that emerges. I'm thinking, and, and I'm leaping forward a bit here, but to a few years back with, uh, with Don Cherry, who has dedicated his life not only to hockey, but to, to veterans' issues, who I think more was reprimanding Canadians than he was reprimanding new Canadians in saying, if we don't pass those symbols on uh, to people who, who join us, who come to our country, how will they know that it's important? If, if we don't have the poppy on, right. How will they know we care? One of those great questions, which I engage with in the book and which we think about at the war museum is how are we going to teach the next generation? How are we going to tell our story? How, how will we ensure that, this modern society which we live in, uh, interconnected, always in a hurry, digitally bombarded, the 24-hour news cycle, all of that, 
it's not easy to sit back and reflect upon our past. I mean, it's just Mm -hmm. we live in a very different time. And yet it's important. Our history grounds us. Our history tells us something of who we were and and why we are the way we are today and maybe where we might go in the future. Um, Our history, moreover, and this is one of the messages I, I tell in the book, The Fight for History, our history is our own. And if we don't tell our story, well, don't expect the Americans or the British or the French to tell the exactly. Canadian story. Yeah. Right. Um, I when I taught at Carleton, I I loved you know I would show parts of Saving Private Ryan or Band of Brothers, and and it was a, a way for younger people to understand mm-hmm. the combat experience. And they said, well, Doctor Cook or Professor Cook, what's the Canadian one? And I'd have to say there isn't one. We we just haven't done a good job in telling our story on film in this case. And I'm not naive. I mean, Senator, you know better than I do. We don't, we can't make films like Steven Spielberg. No. And yet we have barely tried. Yeah. Uh, I guess. And it is important to tell our stories. Uh, and one of the reasons why I'm so proud to, to work at the War Museum is we have about 500,000 people come a year and, and they are getting their history. And I've been there for almost 20 years and I, I like to walk through the galleries and I like to watch people and I see grandparents talking to to their grandchildren and parents talking to their children and conversations happening and people come on over look at this and you know an amazing story or an experience it's a good way to understand history it doesn't always have to be through history books i wish it was right <laughs> but um there are many ways to tell our stories but what we must fight against what we must fight against is the apathy and the the failure to Do the hard work, because frankly, history is hard work. It's not easy to make it resonate with everyone. It takes time. And yet um, I have felt, and as I'm sure you do, that these are our stories and we must tell them. It explains um, a lot when you, and because I was born and raised in the West, but also uh, spent a lot of years in Ottawa uh, on and off, as a journalist and and uh, in this incarnation, and there is a disconnect. Um, the story of the military at home is a proud one, um, even though it may not be discussed. And when you have that discussion in Ottawa about defense issues or we're peacekeepers, not warriors, it creates that disconnect, the rural and the urban uh, divide where these ceremonies are very important in small towns and don't really occur necessarily in big cities. It creates a lot of unnecessary division, if I can put it that way. Yeah. One of the things I I found in the fight for history was um, when I was talking about the silence and the failure to tell our story, the low point is really the 1990s where yeah. nobody, we're not teaching it anymore. Nobody seems to know. We've now passed two or three generations on. And then something quite remarkable happened. And I'm sure, Senator, you'll remember this, the 50th anniversary of the Second World War. So 1994, yeah. 1995, uh, thousands of Canadian veterans went back overseas on their own dollar Um there was a bit of a groundswell of veterans to return to the Normandy battlefields. Our veterans, I've spoken to them, they thought nothing would happen. They just didn't think that the Canadian government would represent them because we had paid so long, you know, we'd done so little to pay attention to them. And they were arrived and the French greeted them by the tens of thousands. These aged warriors um, were just welcomed back as the liberators that they were. And the next year in the Netherlands, the Dutch did the same. Exactly. Hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and that was a really, that was an important moment of change. Uh, Canadians woke up. Both CTV and CBC had live broadcasts uh, in English and French. Um, uh, dozens of journalists were there. And I, I've spoken to veterans and I've read the accounts. They were surprised. And I and what they one of them said, and I've never forgotten this, is that um, we've been forgotten in our own country, but the Dutch have never forgotten Mm -hmm. us. Of course, more than 7000 Canadians lie buried there, their graves still tended to to this day by Dutch children who still understand the importance of liberation. And, And the good news is, I think, as the subtitle of the book suggests, the remembering and the remaking. Over the last 25 years, we have done a better job. 
um, veterans built the Juno Beach Center, which surprisingly, it took until 2003 <laughs> for us to build a museum and a memorial on Juno Beach. The Canadian War Museum, which opened in 2005, the new building, veterans who have um, gone into school classrooms and told their stories. We as Canadians have recorded their their histories and oral histories, um, new books, new new stories told. We've done a better job. And, and importantly, on Remembrance Day, over the last 25 years, you can see the crowds have increased mm-hmm. around on that day at our local cenotaphs, even at the national cenotaph. But unfortunately, it comes, as we were saying at the beginning, yes. uh, when there are now probably fewer than 30,000 Second World War veterans. And I, I, I'm, I'm pleased that we have, I guess, remembered again our contributions and what we as Canadians did in this very necessary war. And yet it comes now while we are transitioning into a new period where we will, we will be losing those eyewitnesses to history. It is so important, and tomorrow we can only encourage and ask people to, uh, in their own way, on Remembrance Day this year, uh, please mark this special, special time. It is uh, an important year, as you say, the 75th anniversary. It's going to be difficult, but I think it's important that we make an extra effort this year. Tim, I'm going to ask you to come back because tomorrow we will leave the day uh, to be its own, Remembrance Day. And then later in the week, we'll pick up and talk about this new period and and what has happened uh, in in more modern times on this front. So we'll come back and continue that conversation. But thank you so so much for today. This is really important that we that we understand this. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, Tim. I'm going to leave you today with the words that we recite at every Legion meeting. I'm the service officer for Legion Branch 62 in in Wadena, and this is our constant act of remembrance. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them.